Good morning, Resonate. Good morning. I am Jackson Purdue, the discipleship pastor here. Uh, I'm so glad that you're with us uh, here in Fremont and through the magic of live streaming in Hayward. Uh, we are continuing our series today by faith, where we're looking at what does it look like for us to have uh, faith, to live a life by faith. You see that phrase all over the Bible. Uh, what does it look like for us today? And as we look today at Scripture, I want us to uh, think about what it looks like to have everyday faith, consistent faith, and the kind of faith that we admire in other people. Like, I wonder if you have ever met somebody whose relationship with God seems so powerful, so vibrant. Like, you meet them, and it seems like they have this reverence for God and this great affection and intimacy with Him that you're almost uh, jealous of. Like, why can't it be like that between me and God? Like, it seems like they pray a lot, and Bible verses just come out of their mouth, and they're not being fake. It's like they genuinely really like God and are really different because of their relationship with Him. And you see people like that, and I don't know about you, but I occasionally meet people, I'm like, man, why can't it be like that for me, with me and God? And for some of us, our relationship with God feels, uh, besides feeling dry at times, sometimes it feels kind of like uh, just very up and down, kind of like trying to lose weight, right? Uh, if you've been around Resonate for, I want to give a long time frame, but essentially any length of time, you've seen uh, that my weight goes up and down uh, a lot. You don't even have to pay that close of attention. I have like a few different sizes of jeans and a few different sizes of shirts that I just keep all at the ready. Depending on the time of uh, uh, year, I'll put on whatever fits uh, the least bad uh, at that time, right? <laughs> Uh, my, so that goes up and down for many of us. That's what it feels like to have a relationship with God. Sometimes it feels like we're doing great. Other times we're not. Uh, and how can we stop this, like this yo-yo of, uh, man, sometimes uh, I feel close to God. Other times I don't. And, and there's always going to be variation. But how can we stop like taking breaks from God or taking breaks from church? And how can we just consistently live a life of everyday faith? that can be this kind of vibrant faith we see in other people. That's what we're going to try to uh, get some help with today. As we look uh, into God's Word, we're going to look at a really uh, peculiar uh, man in the Bible today. And so if you've got a Bible, would you pull it out? If you don't have one, our ushers would be very happy to give you one uh, for you to use today, and then you can take it home uh, with you if you want to. So we're going to be looking in Genesis and in Hebrews today. So... In the Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. In the Bibles that are getting passed out to you, it's page 1007. Uh, but I'm going to read two passages. I'm going to read 1 Genesis 5, which tells us about this guy named Enoch. And then I'm going to read Hebrews 11, which refers to Enoch right, and, and his, uh, his life. And so if, if you uh, stand... For the reading of God's word, out of reverence for God's word, that would be uh, great. And I'm going to read Genesis. That'll be up on the screens. Um, and then you should be in Hebrews, as we will then look to Hebrews to see it shed light. And so this is the word of God. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Then we move to Hebrews. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the word of God for today. All God's people said, amen. amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for standing. So here we see this man Enoch. He lives a very long, righteous, faithful life. And he wasn't perfect, of course. Only Jesus was perfect. But he is faithful and obedient throughout his pretty long life. He, and he pleased God. And God actually just took him up. He didn't experience death. And in Hebrews it says that we must believe that God draws near, that God exists, and he rewards those who seek him. And so how can we have 
The kind of faith like, like Enoch had, where we're pleasing God, we're drawing near to God, that we're, we're seeking him throughout our lives instead of this yo-yo up and down that so many of us experience where we take breaks. And so we're, we're first asked this question, if that's what we're trying to get, why don't we consistently walk with God? The first reason we don't consistently walk with God is that we put our feelings over faith. Now the Bible says Enoch lives a few hundred years and Genesis 5.24 it says that he walked with God. And that phrase, my walk with God, it's a phrase that Christians use a lot. We kind of use it to just mean our relationship with God. But in the, in the Bible it has a much deeper, richer, stronger meaning. Walking with God in, in the Bible is a phrase that communicates the most intimate, the most connected personal communion with God, as if you're walking alongside him. And we see in Enoch's life, he has this intimate personal communion with God throughout the course of his life, this long life of faith and obedience. And in the Bible, you don't see that very much. In life, you don't see that very much. But in the Bible, it's like this guy started really well. And you, you, if you read through the Old Testament, the books, especially Kings and Chronicles, you'll see these kings. And it's like they love God and everything was great. And then all of a sudden, they just abandon God. Or they start their life and they don't want anything to do with God. And then they turn to God. Like it, but we rarely see somebody who's consistently walking with God the whole time. And the truth about us is we're up and down. We're sinners. We mess up. We make mistakes. We have uh, stories in our past we hope nobody ever finds out about, but God knows about, and he died for, and he invites us into his family. It's like wherever we are now, we could actually walk with faith throughout the rest of our lives from here forward. That doesn't mean we become sinless. It doesn't mean we never mess up. It doesn't mean we ever don't feel far away from God, but we can have consistent faith. But many of the times we don't because we put our feelings over our faith. There's no way Enoch did that consistently because Enoch walked with God a long time. He knew he had to put faith over how he felt. He must have felt feelings. He was a human being. He must have felt temptation and given into it and then felt guilt. He must have felt lust and greed and loneliness and regret and depression and fear. He must have felt all those, but in the midst of them, he still walked in communion with God. We don't so often because we let our feelings dictate what we do. When it comes to God, we, we want this religious experience that makes us feel a certain way and we chase the feeling. We'll go wherever we can get this feeling that we want of peace or inspiration or hope or forgiveness. We want to be at peace and not stressed out, so we read our Bible we might get like partway through the day and be like, man, I read my Bible this morning. Why am I so mad? Why am I so stressed out? Why am I angry? I thought I did the right thing. So our feelings really guide where we go. And we approach God as if he's going to give us the feelings we want. And when God or the things of God don't give us those feelings, we push away from him. And then eventually guilt builds up and we think, you know, I'm going to try church again. I'm going to try God again. I'm going to try reading my Bible again. I need to get encouraged. And so we go after the feeling again. And before we know it, we end up treating God kind of like a medicine for our feelings. Like, I feel bad, i got to take this medicine. And Eugene Peterson, is a, he, he recently passed away. He's a pastor, author. He wrote so many uh, great books. And in one of them, he wrote this. We live in what one writer has called the age of sensation. We think that if we don't feel something, there can be no authenticity in doing it. That's, that's really profound right there. We feel... Uh, I don't want to just do it out of routine. I don't just want to do it out of obligation. I hear that all the time. We think, unless I feel like doing something, I'm being fake if I do it. Here's what he says. The wisdom of God says something different. That we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling. Much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. Worship is an act that develops feelings for God. Not a feeling for God that's expressed in an act of worship. When we obey the command to praise God in worship, our deep, essential need to be in relationship with God is nurtured. So you see, if we're going to be people who truly live by faith and experience what it is to walk with God, then we must worship him regardless of how we feel in any given moment. 
We must exercise faith that is honest enough to say, you know, I don't feel it right now. I'm having a hard time believing the truth of these words, but I trust God is with me. I'm just going to trust that God is true to what he says. We've got to have faith that says, I want to please God. I want to walk with him. And so that's what I'm going to do, even if it doesn't feel great right now. So a good question to ask yourself is, how much do my feelings or my pursuit of just feeling the way I want, how much does that help or hinder my relationship with God? This is tough because we're so focused on instant gratification, which is the next reason we don't consistently walk with God, is that we put diversion over discipline. Our quest to feel good, it causes us to live lives of diversion. We go for short-term gratification over the bigger picture all the time. We want to be entertained constantly. This week I was working on the sermon at a coffee shop and I was sitting at the table uh, and I just put my head up for a moment and I looked and I noticed there's a long line and my immediate thought was, oh, I'm so glad I didn't have to stand in that line. Uh, and then after that, I, saw, I noticed every single person in the line, there were like 10 people in the line, every single one of them had their phone out and was looking at their phone. And I judged them for their need for diversion. I wrote this point down. And then I thought, you know, I actually order my stuff before I get to the coffee shop so I don't have to stand in line. And when I show up and like it's not ready yet, I'll pull out my phone and look at it for like 10 seconds because I can't bear to just stand there. I want diversion too. It's why we have little TVs at uh, uh, those stuff you put in your car, gas stations. <laughs> there's little TVs there, right? If you're too scared to pull your phone out and look at it because there's a sign that says everything will explode if you pull your phone out, right? That's where the TVs are. We always want something in front of us to entertain us. And so when it comes to our relationship with God, it's hard for us, many of us, because we're constantly craving diversion. And, you know, just as a word of hope for you, I, I've read some books by some of the people who you would, you would consider it spiritual giants, people who are just like the, the holiest of holy people who we read and we're like, oh, I wish I could have faith like them. And even those people in their personal writings say, it's so frustrating how when I try to pray, my mind keeps wandering, right? They, so no one's exempt from that. Humans crave diversion. But the thing is, you and I know that the really good stuff in life, it requires some discipline. You've got to work for it to some extent. Obtaining the greater freedom requires discipline in the moment, saying no to the smaller freedom. You know, if, if you're a runner who can run long distances or you've got some kind of advanced degree or certification or you've got some skill, something you're good at, and you all have something like that, you had to pay a price to get there. You had to pay the price of discipline and work and time and energy, practice and perseverance. But why do we think it's different when it comes to faith in God and walking that way? 1 Timothy 4 says this, Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. So see, we're called here to take the time to train and focus on growing our relationship with God. It doesn't just magically happen. But because our hope is set on something other than Jesus, we go for some short-term fix thinking, I need this feeling, I need this accomplishment, I need this. So we chase that thing instead of setting our eyes on and our hope on Him. And regular habits like praying and reading Scripture, worshiping, giving, regular habits that go into the Christian life, that sounds so restrictive to us. We think of a relationship with God as something that's supposed to just give us the feeling of freedom and hope and inspiration. But when we approach it that way, as something that requires no energy or uh, effort or no discipline at all, we are actually keeping ourselves from the freedom and hope and encouragement that we could have because we're not training ourselves for godliness. 
So we have to move past diversion into discipline. And D.A. Carson is such a great quote that it, it, every time I read it, it hits me between the eyes. He says, people do not drift toward holiness. See, but that's what we expect. We expect, I'm just going to go to church and I'll drift towards being godly. But he says, apart from grace-driven effort, that is, we work, we put it in discipline, but it must be motivated by the grace we've received in Christ. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness. Prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in, his, in the Lord. Instead, we drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. Toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we've escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. I know for some of you, a particular phrase really hits you. For some of us, every single one hits you. But see, so many of us, we live spiritual lives without discipline. And those of us in this church, we proclaim the gospel every week. In fact, some of you are like, what the heck? Does this resonate? He's just talking about like discipline and you know, work on this and work on that. See, we proclaim grace all the time in the gospel, and that is the truth. That must be the foundation of all the work we do. But some of us, we say, oh, you know what? Jesus has forgiven me, so why do I need to do anything? And if that's our perspective, we totally miss the point of the gospel. It's not a matter of you have to do stuff to be loved by God. It's that God loves us, and that will drive us to live our lives differently. And when we do not train ourselves for godliness, there are consequences for it. Just like when you don't train your, your body, there are consequences for that. This will shock you to know, but I don't have that big of muscles. Uh, and so my muscles being weak, it doesn't just mean that I don't look uh, as good as I could. It means I physically can't do some things that I wish I could do. I can't pick up my kids anymore and toss them, right? Uh, and, and then catch them. I can't... <laughs> I can't, uh, you know, I can't help like lifting things. I can't help, you know, there's certain things I can't do that other people can do. And that's a consequence of me not training my body. But when it comes to training our faith, many of us don't do that. And neglecting your faith and your growth towards God, it means that you won't have that muscle to use when you need to do some heavy lifting. And this is why we yo-yo. It's like I tell my kids, if you don't brush your teeth, the problem is not that you get in trouble. If you trick me into thinking that you brushed your teeth and you didn't, the worst thing is you're going to have bad breath, and worse than that is you're going to have cavities, which cost me a ton of money. <laughs> but I say, not brushing your teeth, there's bigger problems than just, oh, no, I'm not going to get in trouble. So when it comes to our, our faith, many of us, we've got spiritual bad breath, but we've got spiritual cavities. And hard times hit, and God feels far away, and he feels like we can't connect to him, and we wonder why. We think we're free because we don't have to do stuff to make God love us. We don't have to do things like pray or read the Bible. We pride ourselves on not being legalists who don't have to pray and read the Bible to be loved by God. But in fact, we make ourselves weak when we pursue diversion instead of training ourselves and doing these things. We eat sugary spiritual snacks. We pursue our short-term comfort because we want to make ourselves happy. And in so doing, we actually rob ourselves of the greater happiness we could have. And so this is probably this next reason we don't consistently walk with God is probably really the root reason we don't, is that we live to please people over pleasing God. People, meaning us, I'm people, I want to please myself, and people meaning others. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So it's not just hard to please God without faith. It is impossible. And again, sometimes as people who believe and proclaim the gospel, we can think 
There's no point in trying to please God. I can't please him. I'm a sinner. Jesus pleased him perfectly on my behalf, and I trust in him. And yes, that is true. But if you understand what it means that Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live, we wouldn't say, it doesn't matter if I please God or not. We would say, I want to please God. Because look at what he's done for me. That would be the heart that we have. But instead, many of us, we give ourselves permission to sin, permission to neglect God. Because we say we're covered by grace. But if that's the way we approach God, we do not understand the grace we claim to believe in the first place. How much more do you want to please somebody who loves you even when you disappoint them? That is what our relationship with God could be like. And so we, because we want to please ourselves, we think about pleasing ourselves instead of pleasing God. But we also think about pleasing others. And it's, actually, it's really automatic for many of us. We feel the pressure to live up to what other people expect us to do. Enoch, he didn't over the course of his life. We learn in other parts of the Bible that Enoch actually, like, he spoke out to other people about, you know, turn to God, the way you're living isn't right. I'm not saying we don't need to, it depends on what God wants us to do, but but Enoch didn't live to please people. He lived to please God. And Jesus, in living the perfect life that you and I get the credit for living if we trust him, He displeased many people. That's why he went to the cross. He lived only to please the Father. That's why he went to the cross. But you and I, how much do we organize our lives around making other people happier, meeting their expectations of us? Without thinking, we prioritize pleasing people instead of God. We don't realize we're doing it. And so these are the cycles that we find ourselves in. It's the natural bent of our heart to live by feelings, chasing feelings over faith, by diverting ourselves instead of disciplining ourselves and training, and by trying to please people over pleasing God. We live that way, and that gets in the way. That prevents us from a consistent, not just consistent boring, but a consistent vibrant relationship with God, a consistent vibrant faith. This intimacy, this connection with God that we could have that's available to us because he makes himself available to us. And this sermon is not just bad news. Hey, here's the stuff you do wrong. Get it right. It's not saying be like Enoch. He lived way longer than you're going to. He kept it together. Why can't you? That is not the point here. The good news is that we don't look at Enoch and have to emulate him. The good news is that Enoch points us to the only one who ever walked completely perfectly and the one who wants to save us. He points to someone greater. Jesus, who walked perfectly with the Father, who did everything the Father wanted. And because of Jesus, you and I are not saved by how disciplined or diligent we are in our walk with God. We're saved completely by his work. He accomplished your salvation on the cross and through his life. And so the the message is not we must walk with God. It's we get to walk with God. That our sin, the gap between us and God has been overcome by Jesus' work and we can walk in that. The Father sent the Son to perfectly walk so we could imperfectly walk behind Him. But we so often squander the freedom that He offers us and we settle for less. So how can we move towards this different kind of relationship with God? How can we move past discipline into this loving, vibrant relationship with him? And this is where we're going to get super practical. First is this, commit to train. In 1 Peter, as we read, it says, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, training in godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. And training is another, it's another word for discipline. It's a value in every way when we train for godliness. It helps you now and forever. And so the first step to growing into a man or a woman who has consistent, vibrant, real, authentic faith and trust in God in your day-to-day life is to commit to train. Realize it takes some time and effort so be willing to put at least as much effort into walking with God as you do to make sure you've got the DVR set to record the show you want. 
and you set that 30 minutes past the show time in case the game goes into overtime, right? Put that much thought into your relationship with God. Or setting your fantasy football lineup. Some of you guys are so fast on the waiver wire. It's like, dude, the, I just heard that guy pulled his hamstring and you've already got his backup. How does that happen? Like, put a little bit of that into your relationship with God, right? Some of you work so hard on finding just the right filter to put over your picture. When you post it, it looks nothing like you. I have to look at the name <laughs> to figure out who it is. Like, just put a little bit of that into your relationship with God. See, walking with God, it benefits you so much more than any of that stuff. So be willing to do that. It'll take a little work. Second, change something small. Start small. You ever tried to make a change but you start big? Some of you, you know what it's like. You get a gym membership. You buy new workout clothes, two sets. You buy new shoes. Uh, you get new headphones that won't fall out when you're moving around and won't electrocute you when you start sweating. You get a workout plan set up just perfectly. And then June happens, and you don't even remember what gym you joined. Right? <laughs> and uh, some of you, when it comes to God, it's the same thing. I'm going to get right with God now. You get a new journal. You, know, you get uh, your Bible. You find it. Uh, and you say, all right, get a new coffee mug, some really nice coffee. Say, I'm just going to spend time with the Lord every morning. And you have 10 journals at your house with five pages of writing in them. <laughs> right? This is how it so often is when it comes to making changes. We think we've got to start huge, and then we, we fail because we set ourselves up to do that by starting big. So what if you started small? Right? The problem isn't your intentions. It's the fact that you and I live mostly by routine. So it's hard to make huge changes in our life. Most of what you do throughout the day, you do by habit. Many of you know what it's like to drive out of your house, get halfway to work and realize it's Saturday and you're actually supposed to be going somewhere else. Or you leave work, you're driving home, and you get home, but you don't remember anything in between because you just do it by routine, right? And finally this week, last week I kept giving these examples and uh, the amplifier high school students kept saying like, no, I don't know what that's like. I don't know what that's like. I thought of one, all right? <laughs> How about like January when you get back from break and you write the date on the top of the sheet, but you write last year's date and you gotta scribble it out? Isn't that annoying? See, I am in touch with the youth of today. <laughs> But like, how long does it take for you to get the date right, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know a patronizing clap when I hear one. <laughs> so let's think this way. Just start small. Change something small. So right now, what do you, you maybe get up, make some coffee, take a shower. Like in between there, what if, don't, don't change everything, just in between coffee and shower. Maybe then you spend a little time with God, right? What, just add, add it connected to something you already do. Start small. And maybe spending time with God it, it, it is just, I'm going to sit down, open my Bible, and look at it for one minute. Start small. It's okay to start small. And here's the thing when it comes to routines. They will change when something grabs our attention. Many of you, I know your routine changed when Phil's coffee opened in Fremont. <laughs> right? Or you meet someone, and they like you, and you like them. Your routine all of a sudden changes. You pay more attention to what you're doing, where they are, make sure, not stalking them, but just make sure you're around them and know what's going on. Right, you, you put more thought. So our hearts really dictate what our routines are in many ways. And the way for us to grow into consistent people of faith is for our hearts to change before our routines change. And that starts with God reaching into your heart and awakening you giving you a hunger for him. And if you feel that, if you feel this desire, I want to have a vibrant relationship with God. I want to know him. I want to be close to him. That desire in your heart is evidence that God has reached into your heart and is pulling you towards him. Don't resist him. It's evidence that he wants you to know him. It is God's work. And it continues as you pray, as you make little changes, so that you find yourself not just walking on your own, occasionally calling God for an assist, but you find yourself walking with God. You can get there. And if you're wondering, what is the most significant small change I can make? And it is spend time every day with Jesus. 
This is the worst kept secret in Christianity. It's the thing that you always hear when you first become a Christian. Spend time with God. Read your Bible and pray. But here's the thing. 75%, and I'm probably being generous, 75% of the people at Resonate who call themselves Christian don't do this more days than they do. We don't spend time with God, even though we say it's the most important thing. Just add spending time with God into your day. It will make a huge difference. That's why the summer growth thing, we're giving you this, we're giving you this uh, brochure that tells you, here's how to spend some time with God. Here's a gospel motive for doing it. Here's how you do it. Just really practical stuff. So take that step. Make that little change. And the way we'll make that change is, and really the only way we'll do it successfully, is if we cling to Jesus. Because some of you are thinking, I don't need this sermon because I already spend time reading and praying every day. But here's the thing. Our affection for God is never sufficient. From where, it's never where it could be. Because the more you see God for who he is, the more you realize Growing in faith is not about becoming someone who doesn't really need God as much. It's more about realizing how moment to moment you need him desperately. So you never graduate from your need to cling to Jesus. We always do. And whether our faith is strong or weak, whether our faith is consistent or not, we need to cling to Jesus each moment, especially when we feel like we don't need to. See, we waver, but Jesus never does. He is a rock. In Hebrews 12, the first few verses sum this up. They say, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is referring to all the people we read about in Hebrews 11, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. See, this is the therefore God gives us after telling us about all these people who have faith in Hebrews. He says, lay aside the things that hinder you from following Jesus. The sin that clings so closely, don't cling to that. Cling to him instead. Lay aside the stuff that gets in the way. Run with endurance the race set before you. And how do we run it? It says in verse 2, look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. See, that is the cornerstone of our faith and our walk with God. Our Lord, who wanted to walk with you so bad that he endured the cross. He wanted the joy of your salvation. He wanted the joy of calling you his forever. He wanted the joy of being able to walk with you each day here on earth. And then one day being able to take you up and walk with you in a whole new way, better than Enoch experienced. He wanted that, so he went to the cross. And unless you see this, you will never get past, past discipline in your walk with God. Discipline didn't drive Jesus to the cross. Love did. Joy did. You must see the joy in his eyes at being able to call you his child. And then your relationship with God will take on a whole different cast. You know, sometimes you have to wonder if a person wants to hang out with you. You have to wonder, do they want actually to be a part of my life or not? But with Jesus, you don't have to wonder. You look to him who wants to walk with you and sacrificed himself to be able to do it. He is the only sure foundation of your faith. And if you ask him to enable you to put your faith over your feelings, to put discipline over distraction, if you ask him, God, would you enable me to cling to you, then he will do it. He will give you perseverance so that at the end of your life, words can be true of you that are true of Enoch. You can walk with God by faith and please him. And then one day when you pass over into eternity, you will change the pace of your walk, but you won't change a company. You will finally meet him with whom you've been walking side by side. You will meet him face to face. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. 
This is possible for you. It's not just for special people. It's possible for regular people like you and me. We can have a vibrant, persevering life of faith that pleases God if we cling to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the good news that though we are sinful people who will pull away from you, you seek us out, you chase us down, that you love us despite our inconsistency. And God, I, I pray, would you open the eyes of everyone here. Open our eyes to see you for who you are. God, help us see the surpassing worth of knowing you. And God, would you enable us to trust you no matter how we feel. And Lord, would, would we see the joy in your eyes as you went to the cross for us. And God, would, would we see the gospel for what it is? Would we take your unconditional love for us, not as a license to sin, God, but as an irresistible pull to be with you? So God, would, would you, every, every person, God, every one of us, would you enable us to see you through our ups and downs and to cling to you, to experience your forgiveness and the great joy we could have at walking with you each day? In Christ's name we pray, amen.